Welcome, everybody, to the AfriCam show brought to you by explore.org. My name is James Hendry, and we'd love to have your questions and your comments, and you can send those through on the stream, and we'd love to answer any questions that you might have about the animals that we're seeing. We're currently looking at the back end of three elephants, a small herd of elephants that is wandering off towards, I suppose, their next meal. They've just had a bit of food, at least a bit of water, and that's at Nkoro Game Reserve, which is in the northern Sabi Sands, right on the borders of the Kruger National Park. Can't tell if they're walking towards the Kruger or towards the Drakensberg. It's quite a sweet little herd of three, often just a mother and some youngsters. Now we have moved ooh, roughly 100 kilometers or so to the north, and we're on the banks of the Ulifants River. Now let's see what we can see here. Uh, unsurprisingly, next to the water, we can see some water buck. Those are the antelopes with the pointy things on their heads. Those called horns, obviously. And these are all bull water bucks. I don't know where their girlfriends are or why they have spurned female company, but they have. And obviously it means that the mating season is not around the corner if all the boys are talking to each other and being pleasant to one another. Then we've got some Egyptian geese away at the end there, sort of far distance, and a more interesting bird, looks like a saddle-billed stork, a little bit closer in, which is great fun. Tracy Layton, hello. You say thank you for sharing these beautiful animals. They are beautiful. It's a bit of a balm uh, watching these glorious scenes from the Greater Kruger National Park. The Ulifants River here is in Baluli Nature Reserve, which is part of the Greater Kruger National Park, which in turn is part of the Great Limpopo Transfrontier Park, which is about three and a half million hectares of contiguous wildlife land, which is quite fun. And this river really does give a sense of peace. I don't know if you heard there, there was the call of the brown hooded kingfisher going, pity for you. Pity for you. And it's pitying all those that do not live in this marvellous wilderness area. I've no doubt there is a blacksmith lapwing there somewhere as well, because the blacksmith lapwing is the most loyal bird when looking at live cameras. There's always one knocking about the water, picking up bits of food. There you heard the kingfisher again, I hope. You may have also heard some red-faced mouse birds going sort of a liquidy type call. There you can hear them again. And there are various other bird species flitting about, which I'm afraid are just a couple of pixels on my screen, so I can't tell you what they are. They look like swallows, perhaps. Maybe a few starlings. Oh, and there's an orange-breasted bushrite calling. Hello, Cindy, you say hello, um, well, hello to you. And good morning to Anna Emerson from Boston, where I'm sure it's quite cold. Please excuse my attempt at a Boston accent. Oh, she's very poor. I was trying to channel my inner Mark Wahlberg. Well, it's just some lovely sounds. So sticklers and the gentle flowing of the Olifants River. Lots of different trees there you have, and most of them are fig trees, the ones on the left and up towards the top. Imagine sitting having a little picnic in the shade underneath those trees, looking at this beautiful scene. It would be wonderful. You can also hear a black collared barbet going, too puddly, too puddly, too puddly, too puddly, too puddly. Just going back to those fig trees, those are sycamore figs, unless I'm very much mistaken. And they've got a very sort of orangey yellow type of bark. And they make a lot of fruit, which the barboons enjoy. And I'm sure that you will see many barboons on this camera from time to time. 
There's a rattling cysticular in the background. And a couple more waterbuck coming in from the right. Those are youngsters on the right. The older bulls are on the greener grass. The youngsters are, well, for some reason, lying in a bed of rocks. I'm not sure why they've decided that that is where they wish to lie, to chew their cud. Perhaps they're being toughened up by the older chaps towards the left there. Maybe they've been banished there for punishment. Maybe they were being disrespectful to their elders. You know, the ones on the right are quite young, and they are chewing their cud in amongst the rocks. Which is just silly, frankly. Oh, I can hear some elephants in the background too. Which is quite nice. Hello, Cheryl Benick Leak. Cheryl Benick Leak. You say that this is your favourite camera. Yeah, no, I think this is a gorgeous camera. Hello, Kalamazoo from Michigan. Okay, we're going to go across to Camphers Dam now, which is near Kimberley in the northern Cape of South Africa. And we're also going to greet Mary Momo from Hot Springs in Arkansas. Please excuse that attempt at an accent. Right, now we're at Camphers Dam in the northern Cape of South Africa near Kimberley. And what I like to see here are some flamingos, of which there are none currently. Um, I think, I can't actually tell rightly, but I think we're looking at some white-faced ducks. I'm afraid my picture quality is such that it is difficult for me to tell exactly what we're looking at. I can see there are birds, but other than... <laughs> Can't be a lot more accurate than that. It may be a red knobbed coot towards the right there. A couple of red knob knobbed coots. Blacksmith lapwing towards the left. Gosh, this is cryptic. Cryptic birding at Camphers Dam. Apparently there was a flamingo there a minute ago. Well, I mean, frankly, it could be there right now. Hiding in amongst the white-faced whistling ducks, the red-knobbed coots, and the single, I think, blacksmith lapwing towards the left. I told you they were always very loyal. What else we got? A couple of bushes. And you can hear the sound is completely different from the sound on the Olifants River. All right, we're going to go back to the Olifants River. There we are. And then we'll pop across to Naledi, which is also in the Baluli, but just south of here. Now, we've got what looks like woolly necked storks. I Are they? Other stalks just beyond the saddle build stalk there. There may even be abdoms. Abdoms stalks. They are blacker stalks. They, they don't appear to have woolly necks at all. So I think we're probably quite unusually looking at abdoms stalks there. Let me just check. Like I said, it is quite difficult to see. Mm, could be abdoms. I think I can see some white on the belly, white on the belly there. May even be black stalks. Yeah, black abdoms, I'd say. Otherwise, just the peaceful sounds of the bush. I have heard far fewer woodland kingfishers this year, and I'm not sure why that should be the case. Cindy, you want to know if fling flamingos migrate? Uh, flamingos do migrate. They're more nomadic than migratory, though, so they'll move 
into and out of areas, but they don't necessarily migrate in the same way that, say, a stork might migrate or a steppe eagle might migrate. Let me just have a quick look there. Uh, now we're at Naledi. Now, are we at Naledi? Hang on a second. I think this is Rosie's pan. Yes, we're at Rosie's pan. Hang on. Let me just make sure. I'm just trying to quickly check on my flamingos here. Yes, so there are intra-African migrant migrants, the flamingos, which means they do move around Africa, but they can be fairly nomadic. So they don't necessarily spend their seasons in distinct places like other obviously migrating birds such as the steppe eagle or the Walberg's eagle. All right, we're on Rosie's pan, that is correct. I've stood on that uh, log towards the right-hand side there that we're now panning off. And this pan, of course, has been the site of many leopard sightings of late, including the Rosie's female and her baby cubs. The Rosie's female and her baby cubs are not currently here, however. Something has savaged those reeds. I suspect an elephant. Because recently we were here, I was actually sitting right next to that log there, and we saw the Rosie's pan female, leopard, sans babies, but we were looking through the reeds there. There definitely seems to be some form of trauma that has been experienced by these reeds. Ah, there's only apparently one Rosie's cub. Of course there is. There's only one cub for the Rosie's pan female. Good. Well, that's very nice. Now we're going to travel up to the northern province or Limpopo province. As we look at a starling, like a virtual starling, uh, to Tau, which is in Madikwe, the northern parts of Madikwe Game Reserve, and there is a crocodilo. Oh, I don't know, this crocodile doesn't look to me to be the world's most intelligent reptile, and I say that because, well, it looks like it's trying to be stealthy in insufficient water to do so. Still, it's a crocodile that's got to this age, which is quite impressive. And I say it's quite impressive because very few crocodiles, probably ooh, maybe 5% of crocodiles that are born make it to this size. This chap looks to be a sort of good two and a half meters long. I think he's a big guy. But most of them will succumb to predators long before they get to this size. But at this size, pretty safe from just about anything except an absolutely massive crocodile who might try and bite him in half, or some lions who might try and catch him if they fancied something more exotic for their supper than an impala, for example. Now, something I learned about crocodiles a little while back, which I thought was very interesting, was that evolutionarily, try and say that word, evolutionarily, evolutionarily, crocodiles are in fact the same age just about as human beings. So although they look like dinosaurs of the deep, they are in fact relatively recent additions as a species. This is the Nile crocodile I'm talking about. Uh, that's what we're looking at. So they're probably only about 300,000 years old as a species, maybe a little bit older than that, which I thought was quite interesting. Obviously a fairly successful design because their ancestors have been around obviously a lot longer than that. Hmm, where are you going, Mr. Crocodile? I, I, tr I try and like crocodiles. I try and appreciate them for the natural wonders that they are, but there is something about them that sets my blood to freezing. And I think it is simply a human reaction to the dangers lurking in our crucial water resources. So, if you were a, a person living in a rural area in Africa, you would not look kindly on this animal because it would be a great threat to you, even in the 21st century. Crocodiles still 
take quite a few people in various parts of Africa because you can never be sure that there isn't a crocodile in a freshwater body, be it a pan like this one or a river or some kind of temporary area of water. And I think that it's very natural for human beings to look at them and go, Whoa! and that's simply because of our evolutionary past. We know that they're pretty dangerous. Ooh, up we've got some zebras and an elephant who was making friends with the zebras in Madikwa Game Reserve at Tau. Gives you a nice perspective of the crocodile there, bottom, bottom left. Also, perhaps someone would like to go across there and <laughs> chop those sticks off. That would be very helpful. So you can see totally different landscape, different vegetation from that at Comfers Dam and that on the Olifants River on the Greater Kruger. So you'll find there's a lot less rain here than there is in the Kruger and then less again at Kampfus Dam. And Madikwe is sort of on the Botswana border which is on the edge of the Kalahari so it's getting pretty dry once you get to this part of the world and Kampfus Dam on the edge of the Karoo. This elephant of course, we'll have plenty to drink because at Madikwe, well, they provide water for the elephants. It is an enclosed game reserve of about 60,000 hectares, if I'm not much mistaken. Oh, I keep forgetting to check my questions. Ah, Andy, Andy FL2. Many buffaloes, James, ruined Rosie's pan. Oh, I see what you're saying. Thank you, Andy. So we were at Rosie's pan earlier and I was wondering what had destroyed all of the reeds there and Andy saying it was a lot of buffalo. Thanks Andy for that. Yes, I was a little bit uh, concerned about what had happened to them. Denise, you want to know where Russell is? Russell is away currently. Um, I'm not entirely sure. I think I may have remembered. Hang on a second, I just want to check something here. Uh, there go the zebras. Ah, yes. Russell is currently away from the cameras because his wife is giving birth to his second child. So, I mean, I think that's a poor excuse for him to be away, frankly, from the Africam show brought to you by explore.org. But, you know, some people have just different priorities. Off he's gone to be with his wife for the birth of their second child. We wish you well, Russell. Just in case any of you think I'm being serious, I am not. I think it's entirely appropriate that he is at the birth of his child. Right, we have come across now to another pan. And this is also in the Baluli Game Reserve, the Nature Reserve, Baluli Nature Reserve. And this is Naledi Dam. I wouldn't describe it as a dam up there with the Three Gorges or um, uh, Kohora Bassa or Kariba, but it is a very attractive little waterhole where I've actually spent a little bit of time. Ah, yes, now I see exactly where we are. What we have there is a Terminalia prunoides on the right-hand side with those beautiful purple pods. And it is unsurprisingly called the everyone together. That's right, the purple pod terminalia. But otherwise, not a great deal of animal action happening here. That's a gardenia you're looking at in amongst the tambu. Oh, I think it's just a gardenia, actually, that green plant. Kathy, you're saying you're living in Florida and the alligators in most waterways give you pause too. Yes, alligators do give human beings pause, but they are not, in, to my understanding and in, from my reading, anything like as terrifying as the Nile crocodile. They are very unlikely to eat a human being, whereas the Nile crocodile sees us entirely as a prey item. Back at the Olifants River now, zoomed out. That lodge you saw just in the background there, by the way, is Naledi. 
it is such a special little lodge so if you're ever in this area and you want to go and have a hospitality experience par excellence in the greater Kruger I thoroughly recommend it so we're back at the Olifants River and this is about as the crow flies three kilometers north of Naledi Dam hello Ayom you say are there any carnivores there threatening the lives of those herbivores Ayom plenty plenty of carnivores the biggest five carnivores in this area would be the lion the spotted hyena the wild dog the african painted dog that is the leopard and the cheetah and then there are also jackals and caracals and civets an array of mongoose species which are unlikely to eat any of these water buck but there are lots of different kinds of carnivores knocking about in this part of the world Cindy Drake, you say congratulations to Russell and family. I shall pass on your salams to him. I'm sure he will be very grateful for your good wishes. You can still hear there those red faced mouse birds. Hmm, it is such a peaceful little scene, especially when you hear. The orange breasted bush right gang. Just listening to what else I can pick up. Crickets, plenty. There's the woodland kingfisher. They're coming to the end of their breeding season now. They're coming to that time of the year where I always feel slightly nostalgic. The end of the breeding season. Maybe red faced testicular calling there. So yes, Ayon, although this scene looks very peaceful, and it is very peaceful, and I draw great peace from it, there are predators around here, that these waterbuck will have to be very closely watchful of. Lions and spotted hyenas, largely, for these chaps. They're pretty big. Big male waterbuck, about 270 kilograms, and so only lions and very large clans of spotted hyenas would be able to take down these waterbucks once they get to this sort of size. And there you could hear the Egyptian goose. The Egyptian goose is a ubiquitous bird, uh, also as loyal probably as the blacksmith lapwing, but somehow less compelling. I'm not sure why that should be the case, but they are they somewhat uh, pestish, I guess. They have every right to be where they are. They are not exotic in any way, even though they're called Egyptian geese. They are totally localized uh, and in, indeed endemic to this part, not endemic to this part of the world, but they do. They're parts of, lot, many parts of Africa, uh, but something about their commonness I suppose makes them seem a little bit like pests anyway let us now go across to Nkoro which is 120 kilometers or so as the crow flies to the south of where we are now and we'll see some impalas very nice now this is in the Sabi Sands game reserve as I mentioned earlier this is where we began with those elephants this impala thinks that there's a crocodile in here that's why it's looking so nervous always wise to be a little bit careful and cleverly it's drinking out of the inlet for this particular pan it has avoided putting its nose in the open water there is a reptile crawling towards the crocodile at least towards the impala you may just be able to see its head poking up in the water and it is in fact a marsh terrapin 
or a serrated hinged terrapin more likely in this body of water. And then there are a couple of red-billed ox peckers sitting on the impala. Christopher Carroll, you say, is this really a live feed? Uh, yes, Christopher. This is a, not an attempt to pull the wool over your eyes. This is indeed a live feed coming out of the wilds of Africa. Or South Africa, certainly. We've got the Limpopo province, the northern province near Kimberley, and then quite a few cameras. We've looked at three so far in the greater Kruger National Park. Well, that was a profoundly wonderful impala sighting. Having a drink there, we're going to go back up to the Limpopo province, Kumadikwe Game Reserve, Tau, where there are some wart pigs, I'm told. Soon it shall be revealed. There are indeed wart pigs. Hello. It looks like it can hear me, but it cannot. Looks like two young boar warthogs. Well, then I can't see clearly. And the vegetation they're eating in amongst is sort of pioneer vegetation. So this area has been disturbed probably by the construction of this pan and now this vegetation is growing back. It's pioneer vegetation. I'm not entirely sure from looking at it what it is. There's the blacksmith lapwing. I told you they're just always so loyal. Middle of your screen, blacksmith lapwing just being loyal. That, in part, that warthog is now either relieving itself or scratching its bottom. I'm not sure what it's... What? No, it's not. It's having a sleep. It's gone to sleep. Both of them seem to have... Yes, they're both having a lie down. I'd have thought at half past four it was time to get up and do something useful. The siesta should be over. Anyway, that's it. One of them's getting up to be a bit more productive now. Crocky the crocodile has found a friend. That's why he was moving across. And there is the friend. You can see them both. If I'm not mistaken, one of them missing a tail. Maybe that's the one that's some other ones that I knew. Anyway, I'm trying to shuffle through all of the information I have on crocodiles stuck in my brain. Jennifer Strauss, you wonder how far we are from Uganda? Um, 3,000 kilometers? 3,000 kilometers odd from Uganda? So quite a long way from Uganda. Anyway, we're going to leave these crocodiles. I don't think we're zooming in on them. They are quite common here. I mean, they, these two crocodiles live in this pan in front of Tao. And we're going to go across to Kampfer's Dam near Kimberley, where I believe there are some wildebeest and the national animal of South Africa. There are the wildebeest. I'm not entirely sure if this, there's an earthquake at Campus Dam, or if there's a strong wind, or if somebody is trying to fix the camera currently. I don't think there's an earthquake. I feel like the wildebeest would be slightly more alarmed than they are. These are blue wildebeest and they're just enjoying a meal in what will become a fairly less well grass covered area as the dry season progresses. It hasn't started yet, but it will start sort of May, I suppose. Lovely scenes. Little egret flying across the screen there, just picking up the odd invertebrate from the grass. It's been kicked up by the wildebeest. Ah, there is a there's some wildebeest there. I thought maybe there was a springbok lying down as well. Right, we've gone away now. Back to the river at Ulifans, and we've got a kudu. That's very nice. Oh, okay, I've just been told that, in fact, there wasn't an earthquake at Campus Dam. It was raining. That's what that tinkling sound was. I probably should have picked that up. It just looked quite sunny. Anyway, we're now on the banks of the Olifants River where a young bull kudu 
is wandering through the vegetation, looking for tasty things to eat. I'm quite pleased not to be a kudu. I think it must be quite scary walking through the thick bush looking for food in an area that is well stuffed full of carnivores that might like to eat you. There's another kudu up to the left there. You just see some movement. Either that or this kudu is about to be eaten by a leopard. No, it is another kudu. Oh, and another one. Great teeming herd of three kudu. Righty, that's going to be the end of our African show, brought to you by Explore.org. On Thursday, we're going to be having a new show. New, let me try that again. On Thursday, we're going to be having a new show at 4 p.m. on Explore, and it is called Wild Moments. Wild Moments. And there we'll just be looking at highlights from the live cameras and discussing them with you. And there'll be two of us talking about them on Thursday. So until then, thank you very much for joining us on the Africam Show. We'll see you on Thursday at 4pm on Explore. <laughs>